Peter says there were false prophets among the people of Israel and there will be false teachers among us today. It's a sobering thought. False teachers present in the church today, possibly in this very local church, but most definitely in the church at large. Peter says that's a part of what it means to be the people of God. Last week we looked at the blessing of the fact that God has given us his word and that these scriptures are reliable because not any portion of it, not a single bit of the scriptures came about because humans sat down and wrote what they thought was the right interpretation of things. Instead, people wrote as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. And the blessing of true prophets is that we can have God's word to us today. But the blessing of true prophets opens up the danger of false prophets. That just as there are those moved by God to proclaim truth, so there are some who proclaim deception. It's a sobering thought to realize that in the church today, there are false teachers. Would you take a Bible and turn to 2 Peter chapter 2? 2 Peter chapter 2. If you're using one of the church Bibles, it's page 984. 2 Peter chapter 2, page 984. We're going to look at a tough passage of Scripture today. Humanly speaking, I'd be glad to skip this passage and go on to some other passages. But the amazing thing about God's Word is that when God speaks, even when it's hard, it's a blessing. Is that when God tells us what He has to say, it's a blessing to our hearts. And so I'm trusting that God has specifically chosen this passage for us this morning. And we want to stop and listen carefully to what He has to say to us. I'm going to read the first half of chapter 2. Please listen as I read. But there were also false prophets among the people, just as there will be false teachers among you. They will secretly introduce destructive heresies, even denying the sovereign Lord who bought them, bringing swift destruction on themselves. Many will follow their depraved conduct and will bring the way of truth into disrepute. In their greed, these teachers will exploit you with fabricated stories. Their condemnation has long been hanging over them, and their destruction has not been sleeping. For if God did not spare angels when they sinned, but sent them to hell, putting them in chains of darkness to be held for judgment, if he did not spare the ancient world when he brought the flood on its ungodly people, but protected Noah, a preacher of righteousness, and seven others, if he condemned the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah by burning them to the ashes and made them an example of what is going to happen to the ungodly, and if he rescued Lot, a righteous man who was distressed by the depraved conduct of the lawless, for that righteous man living among them day after day was tormented in his righteous soul by the lawless deeds he saw and heard. If this is so, then the Lord knows how to rescue the godly from trials and to hold the unrighteous for punishment on the day of judgment. This is especially true of those who follow the corrupt desire of the flesh and despise authority. Peter says, there will be false teachers among you. He says they will introduce destructive heresies. Now when you hear that phrase, it's easy to think, well, they're talking about false doctrine that somehow there would be people introducing false ideas of the Trinity, perhaps, or maybe false truths about what Christ's death means. And that's all very possible and very real. But I think that Peter is emphasizing not so much an academic conversation about doctrine as he is concerned about the immoral behavior that results from such false beliefs. I get that out of verse 2. Many will follow their depraved conduct. That what Peter is talking about here is the dangers of false teaching is not simply a discussion that takes place in a seminary somewhere. 
He's worried about false teaching that is leading people in the church into immoral behavior, into depraved conduct. Now, while any form of unrighteousness that comes out of false teaching can qualify, I believe that Peter has especially in mind sexual immorality. I believe that for four reasons. Number one, the word depraved is used other places in the New Testament in connection with sexual sin. So when Peter talks about depraved conduct, both in verse 2 and later on, he uses a word that is often associated with sexual immorality. Number two, the three examples that Peter cites in the passage that I've read to you, two of them are explicitly about sexual immorality, and it's implied in the third. Peter has chosen examples that are explicitly about sexual immorality when he lists those examples. Number three, in verse 10, the phrase, the corrupt desire of the flesh. Verse 14, with eyes full of adultery. Verse 18, appealing to the lustful desires of the flesh. These phrases are connected with sexual immorality as well. Peter's talking about the desires that come sexually from our flesh. And number four, false prophets throughout the Old Testament and other places in the New Testament, one of the main things that they taught and promoted was sexual immorality. We can see that in Revelation chapter 2, verse 20, where Jesus is speaking to the church, to us, and he says this. Nevertheless, I have this against you. You tolerate that woman Jezebel who calls herself a prophet. By her teaching, she misleads my servants into sexual immorality and the eating of food sacrificed to idols. For these reasons, I believe that Peter is talking about depraved conduct. He's talking about false teachers who are promoting sexual immorality. Besides that, if you look around today, what other things are false teachers talking about? Sexual ethics are the issue of the day. This is what people around us are talking about, and you can hear and read and and, and see people talking about things related to sexuality. And that's why I believe this is a message from God for us today. That God is saying, look, you need to be aware that when it comes to the issue of sexual morality, there is false teaching in the church today. Now, I want to be very clear. Peter is speaking here to Christians. He's not addressing non-Christians. This morning, what I'm going to share with you about what God has to say about sexual ethics is what God has to say about sexual ethics for those who have identified and claimed Jesus as Lord. I'm not sharing with you what God has to say to those who are not Christians. After all, I'm reminded of what Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, speaking of this very issue. What business is it of mine to judge those outside the church? Are you not to judge those inside? God will judge those outside the church. Expel the wicked person from among you. That what we're talking about today is not how your non-Christian neighbor is supposed to act. What we're not talking about today is that if you're here and you're not yet a believer in Jesus, What I'm discussing is God's expectations for those who have identified Jesus as Lord. If you're not there yet, God's message to you is not about do's and don'ts when it comes to sexuality. His message to you is I love you and I want to adopt you into my family and I want to rescue you from Satan, sin, and death. But God's people have always had a different sexual ethic than the communities or the people around them. And today, what we are communicating is God's plan for those who are Christians, how we are supposed to behave 
sexually. It's also important to note that Peter is not addressing false teachers directly. He's talking about them, but not to them. Likewise, we are not going to be talking directly about false teachers today. We're going to be talking about what is being taught and what God has to say about that. That's important because even though Peter has some very hard language here, I believe the purpose for which he wrote this is not judgment, but mercy. When I was a college student, I was involved in a ministry called Campus Crusade for Christ. And I remember very distinctly a Bible study that one of the leaders at Campus Crusade for Christ led. It was held in the gymnasium at Fellowship Bible Church in Ann Arbor. And I remember the place where I was sitting as this Bible study was being taught. It was a very frank discussion about sexual immorality. And back in those days, we didn't talk about sex much in the church. And there were a number of things in which I was deceived about, in which God had taught about sexual morality that I didn't understand. And as I sat there listening to this man share with me what it is that God has to say about sexuality, it was a very hard Bible study to be there for, but it was life-giving. It was life-giving to realize that some of the thoughts I had come up with on my own, some of the things I had heard from other people, some of the things I had kind of put together were I was being deceived. That the problem is, is that false teachers who are teaching deception, the reason it's deception is because if it was clear it was false teaching, you wouldn't follow it. It's deceiving. And it's so easy to fall into being deceived. And I sat there. And I realized, in, in many ways, I had been deceived. And that conversation, that teaching from God's word was a blessing. It started me on a path towards life and health in this area. And I was very thankful to that person for standing up there and proclaiming the truth of God's word. Because the way you combat false prophecy is with true prophecy. And the way you combat false teaching is with truth. And that God has a message to proclaim to us, not from the world, not about what our neighbors are doing, but to us who are part of his family. Now the message that God has to proclaim to us is important. And the problem with false teaching is it can cause one or two things to happen for those who are Christians. The first is is deception. When there is false teaching, it's easy to be deceived. That's what we're going to talk about this morning. It's also possible when false teaching is present for Christians to become afraid, to look around society as false teaching is embraced as being true, as people who call themselves Christians endorse things that God has clearly said are not right. It's easy to look around society and become afraid and think what's going to happen to those who hold on to what's true. That's a subject we're going to talk about the next time we come back to this passage. But this morning we want to recognize the fact that deception in the area of sexual immorality is something that happens to all of us. And we want to hear the message God has to proclaim to us. Now the message is much broader than just a list of do's and don'ts. And Peter did not begin his letter simply talking about false teachers teaching false views of sexual morality. He began his letter talking about the fact that when we became Christians, we were given a new nature. We were given the possibility of participating in the divine nature. And that's because when you hear people think about the issue of sexuality, sometimes people can say, but these desires are so deeply rooted in who I am, or I was born this way, or I just, this is who I am, it's natural. In some sense, when you hear that, in some sense, they're correct. It's part of who we are as humans. And God has said, look, I came to give you the possibility of a new nature. I didn't simply come to say you, here's what I expect of you. I came to give you my spirit so that you can obey. 
And that's why the message that God has for those who are not yet Christians is this morning is not, here's how I want you to act or not how I want you to act. The message God has to those who are not Christians is I I love you. I sent my son to die for you so that I could adopt you into my family, so that I could give you my Holy Spirit, so I could begin to change you from the inside out. Peter says, make every effort because it's difficult. The sexual desires that are resident in our flesh are hard to overcome. Peter says, but if you work at it, if you make every effort by the power of God's spirit, you can become a participant in the divine nature. It doesn't mean all temptation goes away. But it does mean that before God shares with us what it is that he expects of us, he's already given us the possibility of being new people in Christ. Peter's message continued by taking us to the transfiguration. We saw that a couple of weeks ago. And at the transfiguration, we were reminded that when Jesus comes again, all that will matter is, did you listen to my son? And that those who are ashamed of Jesus and his words, Jesus will be ashamed of on that day. And then when we talk about sexual ethics, There's some unpopular things that are going to be said. And Peter is reminding us, but look, on the day Jesus returns, false teachers will be gone. All of our rational arguments about why we do what we've done will be gone. All of our justifications, all of our reasons, all of our neighbors, we will stand there and God the Father will ask us one question, did you listen to my son? And if we are ashamed of what Jesus has to say about our sexuality, he says he will be ashamed of us on that day. And then last week we heard the message of Peter that we can know what it is that Jesus has to say because God has given us his word. And that in God's word, Jesus is speaking to us, telling us something different than what we might hear in the world something different than our own flesh or our own desires might come up with on its own. And that God has in his word communicated to us what his expectations are for those of us who are Christians, how we are to behave with regard to sexuality. What is that message? Well, let me share a significant number of portions of it with you from a variety of scriptures. I'm just going to read the scriptures to you and they are going to explain or they're going to say what God has to say about sexuality in a number of different areas. The first is from 1 Corinthians chapter 6 and it's the overriding principle for those who are Christians when it comes to sexuality. Do you not know that your bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit who is in you? whom you have received from God. You are not your own. You were bought at a price. Therefore, honor God with your bodies. That Jesus died to rescue us, to purchase us from Satan, sin, and death. And if you are a Christian, you no longer belong to yourself. You belong to God. And God has said, you now have the opportunity to honor me with your body. That you can take this body and bring honor and glory to God through it. And the overarching command is that God says, I want you to honor me with your bodies, the bodies that my son gave his life to rescue. Matthew chapter 19, verse nine. God tells us, I tell you that anyone who divorces his wife except for sexual immorality and marries another woman, commits adultery. Jesus is saying that when you have the situation of divorce and remarriage, if God has not sanctioned that first divorce, remarriage in those situations is a form of sexual immorality, it's adultery. And in the scriptures, we understand there to be three reasons why God would allow remarriage to occur. The death of a spouse, abandonment by an unbelieving spouse, or infidelity. Jesus says remarriage for any other reasons is a form of sexual immorality. 
Deuteronomy 22, verse 20. If, however, the charge is true and no proof of the young woman's virginity can be found, she shall be brought to the door of her father's house and there the men of her town shall stone her to death. She has done an outrageous thing in Israel by being promiscuous while in her father's house. You must purge the evil from among you. This is speaking of premarital sex. Sexual intercourse before marriage. Now thanks be to God, this is from the Old Testament, and the death penalty for premarital sex has been paid for us by Jesus. That penalty is not applicable today. But the passage still gives you a sense of how God feels about premarital sex. Passage number three, four actually. John chapter four, verses 16 through 18. Jesus speaking to a Samaritan woman says, go call your husband and come back. I have no husband, she replied. Jesus said to her, you are right when you say you have no husband. The fact is you have had five husbands and the man you have now is not your husband. What you have just said is quite true. Cohabitating sexually with another person, no matter how committed you are to that person or how committed that person is to you, outside of marriage is sexual immorality in God's eyes. That God, Jesus is saying to this woman, not in condemnation, but to set her free from where she's at. I know you think that the relationship that you have is a committed one, but this is not God's plan for you. 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 36. If anyone is worried that he might not be acting honorably towards the virgin he is engaged to, and if his passions are too strong and he feels he ought to marry, he should do as he wants. He is not sinning. They should get married. This passage is speaking to dating couples and engaged couples. And it's indicating that before actual sexual intercourse, there are some things that dating and engaged couples can do that are dishonorable to God. And that God has not defined that precisely, but has given us his spirit to help us to know that there, are, there is a line before you get to sexual intercourse that is dishonoring to your own body and to the body of the person that you are engaged to or dating. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 9 through 11. Do you not know that wrongdoers will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived, neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor men who have sex with men, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor slanderers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. And that is what some of you were, but you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. When God talks about men who are having sex with men, he's not talking about same-sex attraction. He's talking about homosexual activity. Homosexual activity for believers in Jesus is sexually immoral. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 15. Do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ himself? Shall I then take the members of Christ and unite them with a prostitute? Never. Prostitution or sex with a prostitute is sexual immorality in God's kingdom. Matthew chapter 5, verses 27 to 30. You have heard that it was said you shall not commit adultery, but I tell you that anyone who looks at a woman lustfully has already committed adultery with her in his heart. If your right eye causes you to stumble, gouge it out and throw it away. It is better for you to lose one part of your body than for your whole body to be thrown into hell. And if your right hand causes you to stumble, cut it off and throw it away. For it is better for you to lose one part of your body than for your whole body to go into hell. Lust and pornography 
are not acceptable to the Lord. Now, there may be many questions. I could have preached entire sermons on each one of those passages and perhaps still not answered all of the questions. Particular situations, particular applications, how does this all work? But I think the general sense is clear. That God has been clear in his word of what he expects from those of us who are Christians. Again, this is, these are not messages addressed to non-Christians. This is not about how your non-Christian neighbor is supposed to act. These are messages from God to us. There's more the Bible has to say about it, but as I prayed about it, I felt like these were the ones that God wanted to make sure we understood what he's saying. Now I need to tell you that every one of those passages, every one of those ideas, the world would find something to disagree with about. Those who call themselves Christians can find something to disagree with about. And the point is, as Jesus says, look, if you are ashamed of me and my words, I will be ashamed of you on the day that I return. The world hated Jesus. The world persecuted Jesus. And Jesus says, they're not gonna like my teaching on sexuality either. And the point is, is that I can find any number of people in the world or a number of people who claim to be Christians who are encouraging or teaching the opposite of what I just read you. And the reason why I read it to you from God's word is this is not my idea. I didn't write this out. He's been pretty clear. I get that there can be questions. I get that it's hard. I completely, completely feel that. Really believe me that I do. But he has been pretty clear. He's been pretty clear that he wants us to honor him with our bodies. And there are false teachers, meaning those who claim to be Christians, who are going to tell you one or more of those things, it's not really that bad, it's not that important, or teach the opposite of that. But listen to what Peter says about that. Verses 17 through 19 of 2 Peter 2. These people, meaning those who teach something different than what God says, not those who are trapped in it. Please hear the difference. Not those who struggle, not those who stumble, but those who are promoting a sexual ethic different than what God has said. These people are springs without water and mists driven by a storm. Blackest darkness is reserved for them. For they mouth empty, boastful words, and by appealing to the lustful desires of the flesh, they entice people who are just escaping from those who live in error. They promise them freedom, while they themselves are slaves of depravity. For people are slaves to whatever has mastered them. Peter's saying, if you look around at the world, does the world really have a handle on sexuality? Has the world mastered sexuality or is the world being mastered by it? When you hear what Amy has to say about sex trafficking, when you see the the horrors of pornography, when you see rape or incest or any number of ways in which sexuality is being abused, what Peter is trying to say is, look, if you abandon God's rules for sexuality, where will you get them from? Where will you get your rules from? Will you get them from the world? Will you make them up on your own? Those who want to do that end up enslaved to sex. Promising freedom. Come, come experiment, come enjoy, come try. This is freedom. God says, but the result is enslavement. And that's why what Peter is offering here is not judgment, but mercy. He's writing to those of us who are Christians who are saying, that way leads to death. You don't want to go that direction. And I'm saying this to you again, not out of judgment, but out of mercy. I have been deceived in this area. And I know the death that it brings. And when you hear God's truth, when your eyes are opened, you begin to realize this is the way of life. This is the way of blessing. This is the way of health. 
And I'm not here to tell you something that I haven't myself already experienced is that when God opens your eyes and you begin to walk the process of life and health, you realize I was deceived. I didn't know what I was doing. And God says, I know you were, and that's why I came to tell you. That's why I wanna close this morning with a story that Jesus told in the Gospel of Matthew. Jesus says, what do you think? There was a man who had two sons. He went to the first and said, son, go and work today in the vineyard. I will not, he answered. But later he changed his mind and went. Then the father went to the other son and said the same thing. He answered, I will, sir, but he did not go. Which of the two of them did what his father wanted? The first, they answered. Jesus said to them, truly I tell you, the tax collectors and the prostitutes are entering the kingdom of God ahead of you. If you're here this morning and you have heard these passages, and through one of them or multiple ones, God has spoken to your heart and you feel in your soul he's speaking to you. Today is the day to listen. Today is the day to obey. But the reason I want to close with this story is Jesus is saying, look, if yesterday, if last night, if last week, if for the last year or the last 10 years or the last 20 years, you have not been obeying God's command, but today you hear his voice and you choose to obey, you're the first son. You're the one who up to this point had been deceived, up to this point had been doing the wrong thing. But if today when you hear his voice, you don't harden your heart. If today you say, I was deceived, I want to do it differently, I want to follow God's word, then you're the first son, you're the first child, and the blessings of the kingdom of heaven are yours. This is why God wants me to tell this to you, is because he's gracious. He's merciful. When Christ returns, it's too late. Today, it's not. If today you go, but you don't understand what I've done for the past 20 years. I don't, but God does. And what he said to you today is if today you'll say, I choose a different path. Today, if you say, I've been deceived. Today, if you say, I've been listening to the world. I've been listening to my own flesh. I've been listening what I thought was right, but I know that I was wrong because God has told me something different. If today you say I choose a different path, God says the prostitutes are entering the kingdom of heaven. God says it is yours. I give it to you freely and graciously. Your sins are forgiven. You are my child. Come and experience the blessings of God. The lie you're gonna hear in your hearts right now is Satan's gonna tell you you can't go back. He's gonna tell you that you've done too much. He's going to tell you that this doesn't apply to you. He's going to tell you that, well, unless these temptations go away. Look, I'm not telling you it's easy. I would be lying to you if I told you it was easy. Going out to work in the vineyard is not easy, but the sun says, I'll go. And if today you will say, I'll go, and you make every effort, God is going to walk with you. God is going to help you. God is not here. He did not send Jesus the first time to condemn. He sent him to save. And part of that salvation is shining light into darkness and to saying, look, what the world is telling us about sexuality, that road leads to death. It sounds like freedom. It absolutely sounds like freedom. But it's just a form of enslavement. Jesus says, if you continue in my word, then you are my disciples. You will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. Let's pray together. Lord Jesus, I pray that this conversation would be for my friends here, the same that conversation at Fellowship Bible Church was for me. Lord, it's a hard talk, but it is life-giving. God, I pray that it would be your grace. I pray that they would hear your voice. Lord, I can't convict. That's not my job. I don't have that ability, but that's what your spirit does. Lord, I pray that you would communicate to them your love. We sang all of these songs about how loving you are because that's who you are. God, I pray that even in these hard words, they would hear love.
I pray that you would open our eyes, that we would see the ways in which we have been deceived. Lord, I pray that the death that we are experiencing in our life, oh Lord God, that you would give us life instead. Please, Lord, for those who are right now who heard your voice in your word speaking to them, Lord, do not let them leave this place without making the decision to go a different road than they had in the past. Please, God. Lord, you know full well none of us are innocent in this area. Lord, it's your grace. It's your forgiveness. It's your power. None of us have gotten to understand what you want from us on our own. Lord, open our eyes. Help us to see. God, this is the promise you made where two or three are gathered together. You will be present, Lord. We're asking you right now, open our eyes and help us to see. Make us that first child. Let us experience the blessings of the kingdom of heaven. We ask this in the power of the Holy Spirit. In the name of Jesus, amen.